of our sponsors. So please <laughs> give right. them a warm welcome. Thank you. It's a very tough act to follow, so I'm not going to have as many bells and whistles, just data and results. So uh, a couple of things I want to talk about in the context of pentadecanoic acid in, in C15. Uh, I'll first talk a little bit about perspective having to do with geroprotector development, then talk about C15 as the first essential fatty acid discovered in 70 years, then talk about the preponderance of evidence implicating C15 levels with health in humans, and then talk a little bit about uh, vetting geroprotectors all pointing towards a punchline that C15 is probably the least well-known compound with the most health benefits as an evidence-backed essential nutrient, AMP kinase activator, mTOR inhibitor, initially identified through a cooperative research agreement with the United States Navy. So a lot of backstory here, but I don't have time to go through everything in detail, so I'm going to have to provide you vignettes. Okay, I am a founder of Serafina, one of the sponsors of this uh, conference. And for those of you that were here Monday, you know that I'm also associated with the X Prize in designing the clinical trial uh, to determine the winner. Plus, I uh, am involved in uh, a number of grants with many people in the, in the room. So it's great to be with people physically instead of just virtually. Okay, so one question I want to ask people developing geroprotectors is in what context do you think your geroprotector is actually going to benefit a human being? Uh, will your geroprotector work in people that are malnourished? Will it work in people that overeat? Will it work in people that engage in unhealthy behaviors of one sort or another? Is it going to get them healthy and let them leave a long life if they are exposed to toxic substances? We could come up with a number of different settings that might compromise your geroprotector from inducing the health benefits that you'd like. Further, there are genetic factors that might upset the benefits that your geroprotector might have. Pharmacokinetic uh, variation, how your body actually metabolizes the drug. Pharmacodynamic variation. There could be a big mutation in the target site of your pet protein uh, that disrupts the binding of your drug, let's say. What if uh, your person that you're giving your drug to has a cystic fibrosis mutation? Are they going to benefit from the geroprotector to the same degree as someone without the CF mutation? What about the polygenic background that influences response to drugs? Uh, just as an anecdote, I was in Aarhus on Wednesday giving a talk at a different symposium, and there were three or four talks on the polygenic basis of drug response in humans. I think this is going to be a huge area in the future. So a candidate a geroprotector is rapamycin. I go back 25 years and just point out that humans vary dramatically with respect to how their body uses, absorbs, and benefits from rapamycin. Tremendous human variation in that. In fact, you can go to Farm GKB and pick any drug that's been evaluated and just look at the number of, say, publications implicating genetic variation in response to those certain drugs. About 10 years ago, I had a position peach in, in Nature kind of calling out the fact that many drugs don't work in a lot of people. Got a lot of attention. I don't know that we've found definitive biomarkers that can say who will and won't benefit from, say, metformin. Though, So we have to think about whether or not our geroprotector is going to work ubiquitously. I'm going to make an argument that C15 is moving in that direction of benefiting everyone, not just a small number of people. Okay, so a geroprotector must have broad pleiotropic effects and overcome many perturbations by the definition of a geroprotector. So what is C15? It was, it's a metabolite, natural product out there in the real world, found to be associated with health in the U.S. Navy Dolphins. I'm not going to go through that story, but it's an interesting one. Once it was identified, a team at the Navy then said, well, we're going to give some dolphins a diet enriched with C15 and a diet without. So a bona fide clinical trial was done. Uh, it turns out that the dolphins that got the high C15 diet benefited most and actually had reversals on conditions like anemia, anemia-like conditions in the dolphins, suggesting that it did have health benefits. It turns out uh, that we also looked at these dolphins in other ways, and these are some publications. The Navy dolphins have been studied from birth until death. 
with clinical chemistries and other parameters collected every six months. So a massive longitudinal data set that is now being released by the, by the Navy for use uh, like Research Labs Mind. So you're able to distinguish, say, fast agers from slow agers, look at causal connections between, say, clinical chemistries collected on them. Clinical chemistries have been implicated in health, as everyone knows. Here's just a couple of studies. Uh, Steve Horvath and Morgan Levine a while ago showed you could approximate an epigenetic clock with clinical chemistry. Uh, huge studies looking at the predictive value of health trajectories based on clinical chemistries alone. By clinical chemistries, I mean the routine things you get with your annual physical, cholesterol, triglyceride, other sorts of things. And in fact, Steve and team had a paper looking at actual epigenetic clocks in the dolphin population that I'm describing. Okay, so what is an essential uh, uh, fatty acid or essential nutrient? It goes back to McCollum et al. Moons ago, Linus Pauling won a Nobel Prize for his work on vitamin C. Uh, the U.S. has a panel that is convened to talk about how much the diet should include in essential nutrients. Uh, in a bizarre twist of fate, I was actually a member of this board about 20 years ago. Uh, so C15 is present in some foods in trace amounts, like milk and butter. It is a fatty acid. It's used as a marker of milk consumption, so no one thought it was causal until just a couple of years ago. Found to be active and beneficial over time. Again, the first essential fatty acid discovered in some time. A paper describing this was published uh, not so long ago uh, between, with Stephanie Van Watson and Ed Dennis, the former editor of Lipids. So no slouch in the, in the fatty acid uh, community. Uh, it is a conditional essentiality. All humans have some baseline level, but not enough to sustain health. So we depend critically on external sources for uh, C15. And it's got a lot of, of very interesting properties, as I'll describe uh, in a minute. So if you think about scorecards for what evidence might be in favor of, say, the geroprotective uh, uh, properties of a particular compound or natural product, uh, we could just run through this. You characterization in non-human and model species studies, in vitro studies. I mean, many people have talked about this. Just to give you a rundown, uh, again, I have to use vignettes. C15 hits the mark on almost everything, but very, very large-scale clinical trials done in diverse populations. But no geroprotector has been that. Everything else, we're kind of hitting the mark. Maybe some things are ambiguous with respect to its diagnostic utility. So I'm going to give you some snapshots. These papers are from the literature, not from me. So here's a study that looked at C15 levels uh, and uh, 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 type 2 diabetes risk. And you can see that the higher the C15 levels, the lower the type 2 diabetes risk in uh, human populations based on uh, studies of upwards of 60,000 individuals. Uh, here's another study that took a bunch of uh, fatty acids and other metabolites and related them to colorectal uh, cancer risk. And the only one that popped out was C15. Higher levels of C15, lower colorectal cancer risk. Cardiovascular disease, a number of studies, very large studies, thousands of people, all indicating that C15 had some protective effects against uh, heart disease. GWAS have been done looking for genetic variants. This is important to what I said. Seeing if there were genetic variations that influenced one's C15 level. And the answer was no. There's no genetic variants found that somehow are associated with natural C15 levels in individuals, making it likely to have more ubiquitous effects than other things. Hallmarks of aging, we've been discussed uh, many times. Here's a couple of papers describing that. I can't go through all the detail because there's one I want to really focus on. But C15 has been shown to do all these things and kind of mitigate some of the, the untoward uh, problems with the uh, uh, hallmarks of aging. Uh, the one I want to talk about that's not a true hallmark, but sort of related to hallmarks, has to do with cell membrane protection. So here's a, a, a little known fact. Saturated fats, like C15, uh, have no double bonds, so they're stable. Unsaturated fats have double bonds, and they are unstable. So right here you can just see a little picture of a cell membrane. What this means is if you have more unstable fatty acids in your cell membranes, your cell membranes are unstable, causing your red blood cells to basically collapse and die. This is a process known as ferroptosis. So what's interesting about C15 is you can actually measure the level of C15 in the blood and in your cell membranes. If they're low, you can take C15 to 
increase the level and thereby improve the stability of your red blood cells. So one unique feature of C15, it's not only an intervention, but it's a biomarker. Okay, what about big population studies like in epigenetic clocks? Here's one that took uh, lipidomic correlates of epigenetic clocks across uh, the eight adult lifespan. And what they found is of all the fatty acids, they looked at the number of carbons, C15. C15 has 15 carbons. Uh, the one with the strongest negative correlation with epigenetic clocks, again, this is not my work, this has been published by other groups, uh, was C15. Uh, here's a, a huge study, 16,000 people. Uh, just looking at different markers of health, and the strongest association was with uh, C15 uh, kind of in the direction towards health. Uh, so negative correlations with total uh, cholesterol, triglycerides, other sorts of things. Uh, what about associations with human lifespan? Again, these are human studies. There's some evidence. This is why I had a plus minus by that, because, you know, you can doubt the veracity of these studies. A large study on thousands of individuals suggested there was an association between saturated fatty acids like C15 and lifespan. Another smaller study found something similar, elevations in younger people, not so much in older individuals. Two very recent clinical trials looking at the benefits of C15 with respect to NAFLD, a disease, fatty uh, liver disease. Both showed that C15 led to improvements in fatty liver disease. So actual human trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov, now published, showing the benefits of, of C15. Okay. C15, as I said before, can improve the stability of red blood cells. Uh, one disease that's associated with aging uh, that is in part due to pathologies associated with the weakness of, of red blood cells is anemia. Two million people worldwide have age-related anemia. Uh, it's estimated that 30% of women aged 15 to 49 had anemia, as well as 40% of children 6 to 59 months. One way to correct anemia is to give higher levels of C15 in their diet. So this is all new. This is being worked through the system to try to identify C15 deficiency as a bona fide clinical deficiency. All right, we even worked out the desired levels of C15. You can measure it and then determine how much you should have in your diet, and you can tweak that by taking C15, which has grass status, like I was said before. All right. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, we wanted to take C15 and, you know, I insisted uh, to my colleagues that we want to have a third party evaluate the properties of, of C15. So what we did, I mentioned that I consult for pharma a little bit in my opening slide. We went to what we thought was the industry standard independent third party assay platform that caters to pharma called Eurofins Biomap. So if you have a compound and you don't know what it does, say in the dish, you can send it to Eurofins. They'll do an assay. You give them the different doses. They do everything for you, all done by a third party. So not done by my lab, not done by Serafina's lab. So we sent it to them with additional compounds. Those additional compounds uh, were rapamycin, metformin, 8-carbose, omega-3s, we sent a bunch of others, but the paper uh, that you can get uh, suggested that at the end of the day, C15 had the most activity of all those compounds, uh, including rapamycin. Uh, here's just a, a difficult chart to kind of work through, but these are the different cell systems that the Biomap assay works with, uh, and it also uh, kind of gives an indication of its relevance to disease. So again, this is a pharma industry standard. You have a drug, you don't know what it is, you send it to this group, you get back a lot of information. We did that with C15. Uh, here's the targets that rapamycin hit. Here's the targets uh, that C15 hit. This is dose-dependent relationships. And uh, much of them had to do with uh, inflammation. Okay, so C15 alone is a natural product. Maybe it's the case that you can cure anemia and improve health overall, but will it really tweak things? So what we're now doing is developing analogs that have the same pleiotropic effect as C15. Now, I'm not going to talk about these because they're still uh, in development. Just say that the company has a very broad patent portfolio. I think if you're interested, if you're interested in undermining the, these patents, just keep in mind it's in association with the U.S. Navy. I don't recommend anyone go mess with them. All right. So it ha we have proprietary synthetic analogs of C15 that we're studying now. 
uh, and seeking uh, many other uh, kind of compounds that might have similar benefits. One thing that's very interesting is when people look at geroprotective uh, uh, candidates, uh, not really considering the systems that are tweaked or modulated by essential nutrients. This is really pretty sad because we know that they are health inducing. So if you give something like C15 and it has a pleiotropic effect, why wouldn't you want to study what it taps into, what cell types it taps into, what systems it affects? Because we know it has that broad kind of ripple effect throughout the system to induce health. Okay, last thing I want to talk about, and this goes back a little bit to the XPRIZE stuff. We think that some clinical trials that are pursued to, to vet geroprotectors are flawed because they don't focus on individual responses. They're looking at average changes in some parameter or another. What we're believers in, and Laura Getz had a talk earlier on this, is whether we can improve the health of individuals. So we design trials to tease this out by not focusing on whether there's responders or responders in the population at large, but rather in the right panel, whether we can see individual benefits in multiple systems. So we design studies to, to, to identify those sorts of uh, benefits. Oh, and uh, we've put a nonprofit together to, to run these sorts of trials uh, and actually have a commercial part too. I'm involved, so is Pascal Brandes. A little anecdote, uh, came here to this meeting, Luke Aguilar, who gave a talk earlier, and I worked with Pascal Brandes 30 years ago. So it was an interesting reunion because we hadn't seen each other for 30 years uh, because we had worked at the same sequencing company with Pascal Brandes. All right, so I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Just to mention that there's a book by Stephanie Van Watson that will be published next year on all the properties of C15. And uh, for those of you that have been downstairs, uh, there's a booth uh, kind of mentioning a product, C15 product that you can get now, not the analogs, but the uh, product that has achieved grass status. So it's just basically a supplement that you can buy. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. We have time for uh, a question, if someone has a burning question. Maybe I will uh, start. Have you um, looked at interaction? Maybe I missed it with the microbiome. Yep. So it turns out, as you, can, as you know, with many, many nutrients, uh, when you provide C15 to someone, it does have an effect on your microbiome. So we know, and this is not published yet, what uh, microbiome species seem to be modulated by giving C15. Those themselves could be interesting kind of probiotic targets. So yeah, it opens things up. But again, this goes back to the point, we know that the systems tapped into by essential nutrients are health promoting in humans. Evolution has kind of shaped that. So why would we ignore that in coming up with products that we want to benefit the actual human body? Um, I have two questions. So one is, have you seen, okay, one question. All right. So have you seen any differences between females and males or had the same effect across Not both? pronounced, not pronounced at all. And that was another point I wanted to make because many people working in preclinical settings, right, focus on what happens in the dish in a vacuum-like environment, maybe a single mouse strain, whatever it is. You get your product. It looks like it's safe. Then you take it to phase two, and it dies a quick death because your preclinical modeling didn't capture human in vivo biology. So we tried to stack the deck in favor of things that looked like they would work ubiquitously, and that means also in men and women. So we looked at factors associated with or the mechanisms of action that essential nutrients work through. So no, no huge differences between men and, men and women. All right. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was really fantastic.